it's good fun and, and it does the job it's supposed to do. Raging guitars, soaring vocals, very macho lyrics. Just because they play heavy metal doesn't mean the only music that they listen to is heavy metal. If they didn't play it at a show, there'd be a riot, you know, and, and rightly so. If I didn't throw up on the powerboat we went out on, <laughs> I would get to do the album. Either if I failed, if I did throw up, I'd have to get my ass tattooed. Judas Priest had a really strange start to their career because they got off to a false one with their debut album Rock and Roller in 74, which even they admit wasn't very good at all. It was badly produced by Roger Bain, who didn't quite understand what priests were about. And to be honest, priests didn't understand what they were about because they were still feeling their way on the first album. Halford hadn't been in the, the band that long as the vocalist. He'd taken over from Al Atkins, and there was still a feeling of what are Judas Priest? The jump from Rock and Roller to Sad Wings of Destiny is quite astonishing. I mean, Sad Wings of Destiny remains one of the all-time great heavy metal albums. Um, again, I mean, it's got it's got touches of their earlier sort of not quite as heavy sort of sound to it, but um, it's also incredibly heavy in other places as well. Although the production and the overall sound of the album, obviously when you compare it to the, the metal albums of the 80s and the 90s, obviously the production is more primitive and it has that, those kind of, still has that kind of warm brown analog sound that, you know, that would have been around in the early 70s and all the rest of it. I met them at Morgan Studios in 1975, I think it was. Um, they booked in to do, it was the single I first, yeah, the song called The Ripper. And I was a, an assistant engineer then. And I remember walking into the session, because I joined, they were working with somebody else, uh, some other assistant, because that's kind of how it was, you know. And I walked in uh, to witness KK doing the solo on it and I saw this mad bloke with long blonde hair going ballistic <laughs> with a whammy bar and a, and a wawa pedal. I thought, oh, I like this lot, instantly. And I, I worked on, on that uh, and yeah, that's how, that's how we met. <laughs> Musically, it, it was a massive turning point, and in some ways, it's almost like the first real heavy metal album. Even though, you know, obviously, people cite Sabbath as, an, as a metal uh, metal band, um, it was really Priest that, that kind of removed the last the last tiny bits of blues from the whole thing, and and and, and turned, you know, kind of drew a line between hard rock and heavy metal. And Sad Wings of Destiny is kind of where that really started. If you look at the sort of atmosphere at the time, as I say, punk was just about to happen, but you were getting these very ambitious uh, heavy metal hard rock albums coming out, because in 76 not only did you have Sad Wings of Destiny, you had Rainbow Rising, uh, which once again was a very overblown sort of mystical album. You had Rush's 2112, very ambitious concept album. So, so Sad Wings really fitted in very well, I think, in the spirits of that, that particular time. So Priest with that album, I think, were sort of testing the water slightly. You can see where the, the band that would go on to make s sort of stained glass and, and killing machine were, were sort of gathering momentum. Drink, 
it was a great break for me because the engineer got taken ill. And I said, well, go on, have a go. And I said, all right. <laughs> Didn't know what the hell I was doing, I suppose. <laughs> so nothing's changed. Um, and it, it was brilliant. You know, I had a great time and got my name on, on, on an album that went on to become, you know, in the rock world, a, a bit of a classic, they tell me. No one knows they're making a classic album. No, you know it's good to yourself, and you can't be that, you know, it, it really is down to the people that buy it uh, to tell you if, if it's any good. And time then says, you know what, look at that, that record launched a whole bunch of people, and it's a classic, and you go, well, okay, if you say so, it's not for me to... To say. There are certain songs on Sad Wings of Destiny, Judas Priest's second album, which have beautifully stood the test of time. Tyrants One, which always reminds me a little bit of Deep Purple Stormbringer, but the two which always come to mind, the two they still play live and people love, are The Ripper, which is about Jack the Ripper, and it only lasts about 2 minutes 40, 2 minutes 50. It's not a long song, but has a really chugging, grating, grunting riff, and a certain sense of nastiness lurking in the shadows. It really brings to mind Victorian atmosphere. And a second is about the rather more epic Victim of Changes, which proves for the first time Priest had what it took not just to do short sharp shocks but could actually extrapolate and expand because they had the musicianship to do it. The real secret about that track is that well for a start nobody had sung really like Rob Halford uh, before that particular track had come out. I mean that's you know some of the high notes he hits on that which which define you know that's what most people know Halford for is the his ability to hit, hit notes that only dogs can hear. I mean Plants, Robert Plant of Zeppelin obviously had, had, the, had that signature scream but somehow Halford had had a hell of a lot more aggression and, and, and his his voice was piercing to the you know the nth degree. Victim of Changes sticks out to me because the guitar solo was the first guitar solo I ever recorded for anybody anywhere and <laughs> how about that <laughs> that's brilliant you know absolutely top It was great because you could make a suggestion and it was embraced and that was really, really good for me because I remember there was this, we wanted this uh, on a song, Victim of Changes, there was this, this nice bit where it quiets down and there's a nice little guitar part and it had to be gentle and sort of flowing and I had, I looked, we had a Fender Rhodes stereo piano which has a set of speakers built into it with a chorus effect and it drops from one speaker to the other. I thought why don't we plug the guitar into the piano and, and that's what we did. And obviously you can get a chorus pedal now to do that but this was, and we used it and it's, that's the sound on that record, on, on that particular part of Victim of Changes. And it was great, you know, because any mad idea you had, you could, you could have a go. So it defined a style, it defined the way that Priest locked the guitars together, and defined the way that Rob Halford on vocals interacted with the guitars of K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton. So there's a track that builds and slows down, there's a very soft bit, and then reaches a, a great climax at the end. So I think, um, you know, it kind of defined Priest at that particular point in their career. There's a certain irony in Judas Priest's switch after two albums from an independent sector to a major sector. The irony lies in the fact that the guy who set up Gull Records, whom, to whom Priest was signed for both the Rock and Roller and Sad Wings of Destiny albums, was a guy called David Howes, who came from CBS where he'd made a significant name for himself in the late 60s, early 70s. Howells decided he wanted to go it alone in the independent sector, found this young band in Judas Priest, nurtured and guided in their really early career. The problem for Priest was they are getting a lot of praise, but were still having to do part-time jobs to finance themselves. And Gull didn't have the wherewithal to move them to the next level, which is where Priest were desperate to go and felt they could go. So to me, there's a certain smirking irony in the fact that Priest outgrew someone who used to be at CBS and then went to CBS.
I think if you're going to think of songs that Judas Priest are going to cover, Joan, a Joan Baez tune is probably the last thing that you're going to think of. I'm not sure what Joan Baez would have thought, would have thought of their interpretation of the song, but it's um, you know it fits perfectly well into everything else that Priest were doing. Priest just just took that and, and bludgeoned it to death, really, which was uh, the right approach in my view. And Diamonds and Rust is uh, it's an interesting one because I mean essentially it's a folk song. And um, but had had you you know if someone told you that that was a Priest original, you wouldn't bat an eyelid because although the lyrics are maybe a little bit more wordy and flowery than you'd expect from a Priest song, it it sounds like a Priest song. You know the riff is is a, is a classic Priest riff. I mean they handled it with a certain amount of sensitivity. I mean Halford has got an amazing voice. You know, and he doesn't just have to be screaming out you know like f maximum heavy metal to prove that. The only sort of weird thing is that they chose a Joe Byers song. But, you know, just because they play heavy metal doesn't mean the only music that they listen to is heavy metal, which is a mistake a lot of fans make. The band are people who grew up in the 60s, you know, and the, the metal bands today were influenced by metal bands, whereas Priest didn't have a lot of metal bands to listen to when they were in, the, you know, when they were in their early teens. They were creating metal as they went along to a degree, so to cover a Joan Byers song wouldn't have seemed weird to them because it was a song that they would have listened to when they were younger. They were, you know, when. I mean, that was the rock music that was around was, you know, did come via folk and, and via the hippie scene. Enough to say, I don't think you know had the uh, had the great commercial hits that subsequent albums um, would have uh, would have done. But uh, at the time, I think it really captured quite quite a, a sort of bleak metal mood that um, you know the priests have subsequently refined to great effect. Um, but I, as a, as an obvious debut for, for for a major record label, I think it was it was quite quite an ambitious thing to do. And I, I'm not sure if many people kind of got their head around it at the time. Stained Class is, is a classic. Um, it's the blueprint for modern day heavy metal. Um, because it takes the sort of the power and the energy of what Black Sabbath were doing and then builds on it. And from that you've got the I mean you can you can almost hear the roots of, of modern power metal, thrash metal, heavy metal and whatever other metal, you know, that that, that, that you wanna sort of call upon. Um, it, the roots are sort of uh, are in what priests were doing on stained glass. I mean, they were just basically taking everything they'd done and making it heavier and more powerful and fa faster and louder. Once again, you know, quite quite um, a bleak and sort of mesmerising album. Um, very brooding in parts, very, very, kind of quite a dark mood, you know. And I think Priest would, would lighten up considerably later on in their career. I mean, stained glass first album where the, um, the macho leather and whips and chains and, and all that sort of stuff, um, was very much to the fore. I, I remember Rob absolutely loving Queen and their, their sound and their whole thing. And he wanted to go in that kind of direction with 
big, big vocals. Um, the stage show started looking a lot better. There was smoke, dry eyes, bombs, whatever. You know, to, to, to go that theatrical route, costume changes. Um, so they've always been about doing that. And I, 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 it just seemed the completely natural thing to do. There was never, oh, let's sit down, I know, why don't we, you know, kind of happen. <laughs> the image arrived at the same time as the logo and of the, you know, we are metal and that's it kind of, kind of approach um, that Stained Class bought. Leather, which was on the, the album known in Britain as The Killing Machine, and it's a title track of that same album in America, because the Americans saw The Killing Machine was a bit too violent as a title, and said, we'll go for Hell Bent for Leather. It has become a, a, a celebrated song, because at the time, it was twisted a little bit into the phrase, Well Bent for Trevor, by various people, because everyone knew then Rob Halford was gay. I don't think uh, too many people at the time Thought of uh, thought of a homoerotic uh, angle to that. Priest being priest, obviously, and and, and Halford's um, subsequent uh, uh, coming out, shall we say? You know, uh, I think loaded things onto that uh, particular title that uh, perhaps weren't necessarily there to begin with. <laughs> um. Hindsight's a wonderful thing when it comes to Hellbent for Leather, and I think you can you can find a lot of songs on Priest albums which suddenly take on a, a slightly different hue when you uh, when you realise that you know and that Rob's gay. Rapid fire, pounding the world like a battering ram. I mean, that's the opening line. You know, if you were looking for something, it's right there in your face. Breaking the law is littered, you know, with references that could be construed, you know, about doing something you know, on the naughty side, that's illegal. Living after midnight, you know, if you really wanted to, then that song could say to you that it's all about cruising the gay clubs of wherever, you know, after you've played a gig. I think as with most of their songs, you could, you know, they, like I say, they, say, they sang a lot of songs about relationships between one person and another person, and apart from, you know, maybe Victim of Changes where he actually said, uses the word woman, um, you know, there's no reason to believe that he wasn't singing about a guy and there's no reason why he shouldn't, you know, because it is ambiguous and universal and anyone can relate to it, you know. But, um, I think Hellbent for Leather is a bit of a, a bit of a pointer, really, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, here was a guy that was, you know, perhaps the only, the only singer in a heavy metal band at that time that had short hair and that would come out on stage with a whip and start lashing the, you know, the, the sweaty men in the front row. Is, um, you know, it's amazing that not more, more people didn't put their hands up and go, hang on a minute, there, there's a very real chance that this guy might be gay. If you want to find this stuff, you will find it. That doesn't necessarily mean you know, the, 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 the meaning, the real meaning behind this song is homoerotic. Killing Machine is well. I mean, it's, it's in, you're in you're in a run of, of the classic Priest albums. You've got Stained Class, Killing Machine, and you've got British Steel. Um, and you know, it's it's you know that was that was one of their purple periods. Um, you know, you, you've kind of find bands go they'll have a run of maybe three albums that are absolutely astonishing. Uh, yeah, and that, that sort of define either their entire career or certainly a, a significant part of their career. You know, Priest have had good albums since. Um, but I don't think they've had a run of three absolutely amazing sort of jaw-dropping albums. Stained Class defined what they were about as far as heavy metal went. Killing Machine took it another step further and British Steel exploded it to a mass market. Find the, the greatest Judas Priest album of them all. I think it's certainly a case to be made for saying that uh, British Steel is, is one of the uh, 
Priest's best, if not the best. I think British Steel defines Judas Priest and it's, it's almost their quintessential album. It's probably the first one that you go to when people ask the question, what's the best uh, Judas Priest album? Uh, for a lot of people, British Steel represents a true birth of heavy metal. I would contest, actually, probably Sad Wings of Destiny does. However, British Steel is the most celebrated and triumphant of all the Priest albums. It's got all the elements you want. Raging guitars, soaring vocals, very macho lyrics, very anthemic, fist-flailing, fist-waving music and fist-waving songs. It's a denim and leather album if you want to put it in, in that context. If you want to define heavy metal in a way, British Steel does it better than any album ever because Judas Priest are heavy metal. It was the moment where they went from, from uh, 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 Killing Machine to British Steel and the, l the last tiny traces of blues or that 70s influence just totally disappeared and bang on the beginning of the decade they come out with an album that uh, this is a heavy metal album, British heavy metal album particularly. I think the great thing about it is very very celebratory of, of the band's Britishness um, and, and, then, and the cover which, which is a hand holding a giant razor blade you know is, 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 is uh, I think very symbolic you know and it, and it kind of brings back the whole Sheffield Steel thing you know it touches a few bases. British Steel is when the whole thing came together all they've been threatening with Sad Wings and then Sin After Sin, Stained Class and The Killing Machine just hit. Everything was perfect on that album. Metal Guards, Rapid Fire, Living After Midnight, all those songs are just absolute giants. There's some great stuff on there without a doubt and I think it's a really good balance of, of, of very very hard hitting heavy metal and, 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 and some kind of you know less hard hitting sort of carefully worked pop songs almost. It's very easy to write a heavy metal song that's just a heavy metal song but it's very difficult to write one that's still heavy and catchy so that it, you know, someone at radio might be interested in playing it, but you're not going to piss your fans off because it's become popular because it's still heavy. And that's what Priest always managed to do. Priest just hit a focus and a groove at that point. They hit serendipity, if you will. And Fate created one of the greatest, not just greatest metal albums of all time, one of the most important rock albums of that era. Breaking the Law is one of those songs like Smoke on the Water and Paranoid that, um, that are by no means the best songs in their respective band's catalogues, um, but they are uh, the catchiest songs and the easy easiest to digest. And Breaking the Law has an opening riff which is so instantly memorable, you can you know whistle it after hearing it just once. Well, I think it's a sense of humour about it as well, which some people miss out with Priest. They do have a great sense of humour, but the whole thing combines and it sends a real smile in your face. Absolutely hilarious track. I mean, it's, it's Priest at their cheesiest. I think it was done with, with, with tongues firmly in cheeks. Uh, and if it wasn't, you know, um, <laughs> a, bit, a bit of a shock, really. It's a brilliant anthem, absolutely superb. And one of the cleverest things about it is in the middle of the song, you hear the sound of breaking glass. At a time when sampling didn't exist, what Priest did in the studio was actually smash up milk bottles to get that sound. So they were using a little bit of studio ingenuity. But the thing about Breaking the Law is it's just such a rousing, galloping anthem. You never get fed up with it. If they didn't play it at a show, there'd be a riot, you know, and, and rightly so. And I think British Steel was, was the moment where heavy metal became a thing in its own right and the image that, Pri that Priest had as well with the studs and the leather and the hair and the, you know, the motorbikes and everything else, although there'd obviously been elements of that in, in hard rock and certain bands had toyed with that stuff before, Priest absolutely nailed it and this is the heavy metal sound, this is what a heavy metal band looks like, you go to a heavy metal show and there's a shitload of pyrotechnics and lights and it's really exciting and explosive and over the top. Certainly those three Priest albums of Stained Class, Killing Machine and British Steel that is where you can see that modern metal really sort of came from um, you know um, or, or at least that and Sabbath you know put the two together and you got one hell of a heavy metal band Interestingly enough, Judas Priest with British Steel have reached a point in the UK where they're a 
pretty popular. When the first Monsters of Rock at Donington happened in 1980, Priest was second on the bill. But what they hadn't really done is crack America big time. They'd been there, they certainly started to get a buzz going. What they did with Point of Entry is say, OK, we've got a strong audience in Europe and in the UK and in Japan as well. Let's turn our attention to America. Let's make an album the Americans can start appreciating. And they made an American-friendly metal album. Quite frankly, I mean, Point of Entry is not a very good record. Point of Entry is, um, is, is no one's favourite Priest album, is it, surely? I can't, I can't imagine there's anyone out there that, that prizes it above all the others. I think uh, Glenn Tipton's gone, or KK, one of the two anyway, have gone on record as saying that they were under too much pressure because of the, the commercial success they'd achieved with British Steel to sort of follow it up. They were on the back of a run of great albums. Albums. And then his album came out, it's like, well, what the hell is this? You know, it's slow, it's ponderous, it's moody, it's not very catchy. You know, little wonder they didn't really hit off it, really. It wasn't as heavy as British Steel, it didn't have as many catchy songs on it as British Steel. The sound of it was a little bit too polished, and although, you know, there are some metal bands that, well, even Priest sometimes can get away with being polished, it doesn't necessarily reduce the power of what they do, but it didn't really suit them at that point after an album like British Steel. So, with the possible exception of heading out to the highway, I don't think there was any songs on that that, that sounded like the, uh, the super confident priest that had, that had developed over the previous few albums. It was a risk. They could have easily just ended up collapsing, not making it into America, and really being superseded and overridden by the new wave of British heavy metal, especially Iron Maiden, and ending up with no career whatsoever, or the remnants of a career. It didn't happen because Point of Entry was good enough, and they played live with a certain energy and power that convinced British audiences, oh, Priests are still a great live band, and maybe not convinced by Point of Entry, but Let's be honest about it, that songs like Desert Plains Live have a real edge to them. I think, yeah, Point of Entry, is that there's been a couple of albums in the Priest catalogue where it looks like they've lost their way slightly, but um, I think because of, you know, in the 80s people were much more prolific and could do an album every year, um, there would only have been a, a, you know, a 12, 18 month period where people were saying, oh, Priest have lost the plot, and then of course they release Screaming for Vengeance and it takes everyone's head off and, and uh, it's like, oh no, they were just having a laugh with Point of Entry, don't worry, we won't talk about that anymore, let's listen to this one instead, you know. I think as soon as you hear Screaming for Vengeance, which was a follow-up to Point of Entry, you know Priest have found their mark, not just in America, but have found a way of recording an album that was going to be big in the United States without divorcing them from their fan base in the UK and in Europe and Japan. And the songs hit very hard. And the perfect example, the opening of a Helium and Electric Eye, which combined is still a great Priest opening. It's very dynamic, very big. It's a huge production number that actually doesn't need much production. It's all in the sound. It's a killer combination, really. Helium followed by electric eye, you know, you can't really get too much better than that. The Hellion and electric eye is the only way I would expect Priest <laughs> to start a show. I can't imagine them starting with anything else now, but it would be nice if they did. The Hellion is one of those things, it's like, you know, you hear it and it's like, ah, oh, Priest are coming on in a minute. They don't actually have to be on stage as that thing plays, you know, and then the opening riff kicks in and lights go off and Halford's standing at the back and they're all in position and uh, it's just one of those kind of perfect moments that, you know, it's, uh, you know, you kind of know it's coming, but, you know, in a kind of slightly nostalgic, cosy way, it would be, almost be a shame if they did anything else, although they could, you know. A great dynamic instrumental piece which opened the, uh, the uh, Scribby for Vengeance album and crashes into Electric Eye, the second song. And that's the way Priest has started their show for so long live because it's the perfect way to do it. Electric Eye always to me conjures up visions of, of Lord of the Rings and this, this great big glowing red thing, you know, going uh, across the planet and uh, killing all its surveys or whatever. Um, so it is, it is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bloody good start to a show without a doubt, but Priest have got so many classics in, in, their, in their back pockets. Like all the, all the greatest metal bands, they, when they come on stage you know they're there and they make a huge impact and you know you can't take your eyes off the stage and you get that massive adrenaline rush and that's, that's a brilliant way to, 
to open any show, you know. There's a lot of drama in what priests do, and the, and the Hellion is such a dramatic opening, it's almost, you know, it, it would work if an orchestra played it, you know, so it's, um, uh, yeah, I think it, even watching them do it now, I still get that sense of being a, you know, 16-year-old, you know, practically wetting myself with excitement, you know. <laughs> The fact that Screaming for Vengeance was, was, was such a big success was purely because it was a great album. There were no singles really propelling it. It was just a great all-round epic. It's kind of like a, if you take everything that they'd, they'd done up till that point, but particularly British Steel and Point of Entry, it was like a kind of distillation of all the best parts of, the, of those albums um, with a renewed level of heaviness. I mean, it's by far the heaviest album they'd done at that point, particularly the title track, which is you know, pretty brutal, really. And given, given what else was going on in, in metal at the time with the emergence of thrash and all the rest of it, they had, you know, they had to kind of uh, put their foot down and, and, and kind of um, assert their authority as the leading heavy metal band. And I think that they did that with a, an almost flawless collection of songs. Screaming for Vengeance became a massive record for two reasons, I think. Firstly, because the time was right in America. There was a feeling that heavy rock, heavy music, hard rock, metal, or whatever you wanted to call it, was making a real inroad in the United States, especially through the burgeoning MTV and so forth. And radio was much more aware and acute to what was going on. And secondly, because they made a great example of it, all their experience over what was at that time, nearly a decade of recording came to roost on that album. Priest were one of the first British heavy metal bands to really, really sort of ride through on the back of MTV. The hair is bigger. The, 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 jack, the jackets have got more tassels on them, you know. The leather trousers are tighter. Um, and the, the whole stage production is bigger, right? And that just says one thing, try and sell to America, because unless they have it like that, you know, they can't get it. It's just one of those things, you know, synchronicity, when you, you make a brilliant album just at the point where, you're, where you need to make a brilliant album and then it all, everything explodes. Turbo in 1986, I've always believed, was an incredibly brave attempt to be something different. The vast majority of people will disagree with me and reckon it's complete rubbish. <laughs> oh dear. I don't think it was a horrible mistake necessarily. I mean, uh, you know, it was still a relatively popular album, but I think it freaked the fans out quite a lot. You know, they thought, what on earth are they doing? Um, Turbo. Um, I think Turbo was, was a fantastically brave move for Priest, actually. <laughs> it's okay. Turbo was the album that I struggled with for a long time. I actually really like it now. It's, um, I wouldn't say it was one of my favourites, but I, I think it's a much better album than, than it appeared at the time. But it was a bit, oh my God, what have they done? It's got keyboards on it, you know, and, and lots of them, and they're really prominent on every song, and um, it all sounds very futuristic and modern. I mean, now it doesn't sound futuristic at all. It just sounds like they've turned on the DX7, you know, and uh, someone's done that for, for 20 minutes. I think in hindsight, you kind of listen back and think, well, I can see what you're trying to do. I'm not it certainly worked all the time. Songs like Turbo Lover, Parental Guidance, Locked In, Rocky All Around the World, they're very good tracks. I love Turbo Lover, it's a fantastic track. Um, uh, the way, the way uh, Halford says, I'm your turbo lover, <laughs> it's, just, it's just brilliant. And, and the, the song sort of throbs and pulses, you know, and, and, and it, I don't know, it just all works really, really well. I, I think it's a great, great track. Turbo Lover is um, actually very similar in tempo and, and feel to You've Got Another Thing Coming, except for, of course, the, the synths, you know, but it's one of those plodding ones with a kind of pulsing beat. And uh, um, I don't know whether it was a deliberate attempt to recreate the 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 feel of you've, you've got another thing coming or, or a way of covering their backs maybe in a way because we're doing this album that's radically different that's got all these synths on it perhaps we ought to do something that at least people people can recognize as being a, a kind of priest style thing so that it doesn't freak anyone out most priest fans didn't like it i think it's a strong song and 
if you take away the synth influence, it actually stands up as a very good priest anthem, but because of all the layered production and so forth, most people shrug it off and say, well, like the whole of that album, bit of a waste of time, wish they hadn't done it. There really was a sense of going into decline at that point. When Pain and Killer happened in 1990, priests were in desperate need of a real shot. Now they'd gone to the whole area and era of Turbo, they tried to get back to basics again with Ram It Down in 88 and had failed particularly. It wasn't a great record, they had an appalling version of Johnny Be Good that most people would rather forget. So priests were really at a crossroads. There was a new young generation coming through who weren't just challenging for the supremacy of metal, they were threatening to knock bands like Priest into the middle age making them really irrelevant in a funny sort of way. I did this, this band uh, called Slave Raider from Minneapolis and they had their video on MTV and Glenn was watching it with Ken and they thought, well, who the hell, this is amazing. Well, the sound of this, we'd... L and they found out it was me, called me up. <clears throat> we, they went over to Spain to, to, to meet with them. What about making a record? Sure. Okie dokie. So the test actually of getting the record to do was if I didn't throw up on the power boat we went out on, <laughs> I would get to do the album. Either if I failed, if I did throw up, I'd have to get my ass tattooed or something like that. So I kept my dinner in, let me tell you. This is another example of, of priests, you know, subtly turning the screw, really, and, 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 and reinventing themselves, but not in a completely obvious way. But having said that, I think Painkiller is an extremely brutal record, very much in keeping once again with the spirit of metal of that time, which had become quite brutal and quite extreme. You know, bands like Slayer obviously were entering the mainstream. Bands like Pantera, who um, you know, who I think uh, you know, Rob Halford uh, used to be a very big fan of, um, you know, were, were influencing I think Priest's approach at that point. I don't think anyone believes that 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 Priest getting heavier and harder on Painkiller was anything to do with trying to copy what was around them to maintain their status, but really taking on board the influence and thinking this is great because these bands are taking you know the most dynamic and, and fast and frenetic stuff we were doing from you know like Stain Class and, and, and Killing Machine and they're taking it and making it even more and they got influenced by that. Those of us that like really heavy music were shitting ourselves, it was a fantastic record, you know, it's, it's my favourite Priest album by none. I think people got a bit fed up with kind of the pap that was going on by most other bands and it was like we're going to make a heavy metal album and it's going to be heavy. Okay, says me, no problem. <laughs> And we did. I felt to me for uh, uh, for a long time um, when they started changing back into the, the heavier sort of sounds after Turbo when they'd ram it down, etc. The machine style wasn't what it should be. As a fan, I wanted to hear a proper, you know, band playing. And that's kind of how we approached that record. Uh, they played it all together. We then went back and replaced the guitars with the proper sounds and everything, but it was played with a drummer from start to finish. No tricks, no, no computers, no what you hear is what happened. And that, that is a great performance. And that's why I think that record sounds a big contribution to, to, to why it sounds like it does. Because it's, a, it's people giving it their all. Painkiller was kind of like Priest saying, yeah, we can do this stuff as well. And actually we can, we can, we can do it at the same time as still being a traditional heavy metal band and we can rip your face off. You know, the, the title track particularly is just that absolutely fucking outrageous song. You know, it's one of the most ridiculously over the top metal songs of all time. And yet it's totally credible. It's not, it's not like a bunch of old, old guys trying to do a thrash metal song. It's a, it's a classic, you know, full stop. It's so heavy. 
you know, it's it's almost relentless. Um, and they were right back on form with that. And in fact, it was only Halford quitting, you know, that, that stalled what could have been another great spurt. When Rob Halford left the band in 1991, everybody was amazed, not least the rest of the band. They didn't see it coming. They knew Halford wanted to do a solo project. In, in fact, in a way, Halford was the one driving, getting more extreme. He was excited by a new era with metal going further and further underground, more energetic, speeding up, dynamism. State-of-the-art metal in 1980 was Iron Maiden. By 1990, what Iron Maiden represented was far more mainstream. And Halford was excited by all of that. And then suddenly he felt, you know what, I can't do it in Priest. Despite the fact that the rest of the band said, take a break, do what you want to do, we'll get back together in a couple of years, he decided, no, it has to be a complete divorce. I have to get away from Priest. I think for the band, it was the biggest shock of all. For the rest of us, it, we were all amazed by it. but. You can imagine what Judas Priest was thinking after how many years together suddenly we don't have a singer anymore. The two remaining main guys in Priest, the guitarists uh, KK Downing and Glenn Tipton, felt a bit lost without Rob really and di didn't really know what to do. Um, I think they knew they wanted to carry on with Judas Priest but, but they, they didn't really know how and they didn't really know what kind of guy could replace Rob, you know? So it took them a long time for them to get their head around that. Priest waited five years and then found in Tim Ripper Owens the best possible replacement. Strangely enough, he came from a Judas Priest tribute band. So his hero was Rob Halford. But what Ripper managed to do from the early days was actually stamp his own mark on things. He sounded a little bit like Rob Halford, but he wasn't Rob Halford. He was very much his own man, certainly in those early days. And you thought, you know what? Priests were absolutely right to wait as long as they did because they got the right guy for the job. I think Tim was a good choice in that he sounded similar enough to Halford that they could, you know, in theory, do similar material without it sounding like they'd crowbarred in somebody desperately inappropriate on top of their traditional sound. But they also changed their sound at the same time, and so it, it did seem slightly incongruous while, while Halford was doing some slightly bizarre stuff himself at the time, you know, having done Fight and then doing the Two thing, which was just weird and wrong. Um, it just seemed that, that both, both parties were kind of clutching at straws a little bit at that point, and uh, the Jugulator album, although it's, you know, it's, had it been had it not had the Judas Priest name on it and had somebody else's name on it, I think people would have been a lot more receptive to it, but it was um, losing someone as iconic as, as Halford kind of meant that Priest were a bit stuck. Well, it certainly wasn't Priest as you wanted them, but I'm an old Priest fan, I'm going to see Judas Priest because I want to hear the classic songs and I don't mind that Ripper's up there singing them. Am I interested in any new records they put out? Not at all. Ripper Owens, Tim Ripper Owens, to give me his full name, did two studio albums with Priest in 97 Jugulator, which was a good introduction. Uh, the problem was that there was very much, there was very much a two-pronged feeling towards the situation. Some people felt Priest without half we shouldn't be carrying on. Other people felt, well, you know what? It's too modern. Somehow it doesn't represent what we want from Judas Priest, the old Judas Priest. Priest took Painkiller as their benchmark and seven years later moved it forward. It was certainly an album that wasn't designed to compete with what was happening in the world of metal at the time, the, the thrash, death metal, also the, the, the emergence slowly of new metal, but it certainly reflected the time. I think Jugulate is a great album, but it's not a great Priest album. It's kind of, it's, it's something else. They, they tried something and it kind of worked and that, that you know, and they, I think they should be applauded for that really because they could have done an album of, you know, kind of sound alike Priest classics and stuck Ripper on them and it would have been the soft option but instead they opted to do something that was a bit heavier and a bit darker and and to give their new singer something slightly fresher to to work with you know and there are some good songs on that album. Cathedral Spa's a great track, Burn in Hell, Bloodstained, Stained, really strong strong songs and the thing was that Tim Owens on that record proved 
that by, while he was definitely following in Halford's footsteps, he was no Halford clone. To a lot of Priest fans, Priest stopped after Painkiller and started again with Angel of Retribution. And I think, you know, it's almost like you, there's nothing too much wrong with those albums in a way, but they're not really part of the Priest story in the same way. They kind of, they stick out as being, you know, a little bit ropey compared to <laughs> the heights that Priest are capable of. your head, sir. Where are you going tomorrow? Sleep well. When Rob Halford came out on MTV, literally came out on MTV and said he was gay, I think there are two things to bear in mind. Most people in the industry, most bands, most managers, most record labels said, well, we've known that for years, so what? No surprise. No surprise to Priest, because they said, well, yeah, we knew about it. What amazed a lot of people was that the fans didn't know. They were stunned. They had no clue that the metal god, their hero, their idol, Rob Halford, despite all the hints over the years, was actually gay. Halford announcing he was gay was about as shocking as discovering the Pope was a Catholic or the bears shat in the woods. We all knew it. You know, I mean, he didn't have to tell us. You only had to see him mincing around on stage to sort of, you know, I mean, and I, I'm not being homophobic by saying that. I mean, he had, you know, certainly I remember on the painkiller tour, sort of standing there and thinking, Maybe you shouldn't mince around quite so much, Rob, you know, it's, it's, it's getting quite effeminate. And I think there was an initial shock, but the interesting thing was while the tabloids and certainly the yellow press in, in music and in media tried very hard to paint it as how can the metal god, the man who stands at the pinnacle of the most macho music in the world, be gay, most fans said, so what? Most people were like, yeah, whatever, it's, it's Rob Halford, he's the metal god, you know, it's... Does it really matter? And of course it doesn't, you know, I mean, if, if it bothers you, then you're a fucking idiot, aren't you, really, so... Interestingly, um, when I talked to Rob, uh, when he returns to the priest ranks, he said to me that if he'd stayed in Judas Priest, he would never have come out as gay. He'd never have come out as gay, um, because he didn't want to damage the band. But he was glad that he came out when he had a break from the band, so when he returned, Everything was you know, out in the open and nobody really gave a damn. I think Rob's return was inevitable if, if Judas Priest were to survive. Um, you know, they, they had a They'd done a couple of decent albums, decent studio albums with, uh, with, with Ripper, but uh, it wasn't really happening, you know. Priest were in de commercial de decline. Their sales were going down, there's no doubt about it. Ticket sales are falling off, record sales are falling off, and however much they stood by Ripper Owens and said, this is the guy for the job, you always knew sooner or later the pressure was going to be on them from two areas, one commercial, two musical because nobody worked better with Priest than Rob Halford. So yes, there was an inevitability about it and a great delight from among the fans, but I do feel sorry for Rupert Owens because he did nothing wrong. It was one of the great reformations that you wanted to see, I guess. I mean, that's the great thing about bands, people leaving bands, is that they've always got the option of coming back. And whilst half the time they come back and it's utter cock, you know, at other times, like the Judas Priest re reunion, you know, it, it, it all works, it all falls into place again, and it's all absolutely fantastic. I think Age of Retribution is one of the best albums I've ever made. I think it topped most um, metal writers in the UK, their, their album of the year poll. Um, because it's such a great record. Um, you know, I mean, it, it had everything. I mean, the songs were really good. Even Loch Ness. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's, just a, it's just an awesome record. And, and Halford sounds brilliant. Singing with the band again, you know, um, it, it just encompasses everything. It was great, it was heavy, but it was still very catchy. Um, you know, and they were great live. As a fan, I think not what I would have wanted to hear. I wanted to hear where Painkiller left off because that's where it should have and it didn't and maybe that's what they were writing at the time obviously you know but certainly if I had anything to do with it it wouldn't it would have been a much much I don't know what the word would be uh, more of a continuation I guess.
think with Priest, um, it's a combination of Rob Halford, Glenn Tipton and K.K. Downing, which makes it work. Ian Hill is an important part, he's been there since day one, and he's very much crucial to the Priest setup. Scott Travis is a great drummer, and he's been there since 1990. But in reality, the heart, soul, mind, brains, passion, and power comes from the three guys up front, Halford, Downing, Tipton. If Ian Hill left tomorrow, people would say, great bassist, he did a tremendous job, but another bassist will come in. As long as those three are there, then Priest are there. It's good fun, and, and it does the job it's supposed to do. You go see them, and you come out, big grin on your face, you've lost a load of dandruff, and it's, it's great, you know. <laughs>